what it takes to use Invoke Dynamic for something in the real world, a product. Well, Go ahead, Attila. All right. Um, can you help me with fixing up the uh, mic? Yeah, well, you know, whenever I realize I need help, I ask for it. Test? Online. Yeah, I think it's... I can, <coughs> I can hear myself speaking, so it must must be on. Also, uh, can you can you fix it on my uh, pocket? Yeah, I'll put it on now. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay, so you can do us a favor. Yeah. Stand there. Try to do that. All right. Hey, folks. All right. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, hi. I'm Attila. I, um, I'm writing a JavaScript runtime. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, this is the usual Oracle, don't believe anything I say slide long form. Uh, so I'm working, myself and Marcus, we are working on Nashorn. And there is few more people who are working on Nashorn that are currently not present here. The team is currently about five people, which is actually ridiculously low for a project this size, but you know, we're managing. Uh, it's an... It's <laughs> What's great about this project is it's, it's it's all in open JDK, so anybody can check check on uh, on all the all the crazy stuff that we are doing, and it, it, it can even participate. Uh, we shot for making an ECMAScript five point one compliant runtime, and we did actually succeed in that. Actually, Nasfon was the first uh, JavaScript runtime that that passed hundred percent of the specification, and it happened in a bar in Stockholm when it the tests for the first time. It's, uh, it has no interpreter. It uh, compiles to Java bytecode on the fly. This has a bunch of interesting implications. One of the reasons we replaced Rhino was that Rhino, being a pure interpreter, had a problem with, as the code is running in the interpreter, it actually has the privileges of the interpreter, which is in the boot class pass. This can be get around with, with all kind of uh, crazy, um, crazy trampolines, but it's not uh, so nice. Um, there's other reasons to use uh, compilation, obviously, which is th that we are able to use in Walk Dynamic. So yeah, security mindedness was one of the um, ideas here. Also, we wanted to really lay a groundwork for for general dynamic languages support on the JVM. This is pretty much large scale dog fooding of uh, of Invoke Dynamic and related concepts, just to see whether we can create a production level uh, uh, language runtime with it. Um, Next up is Java A240. It is just around the corner. It is uh, mostly a performance release uh, as far as Nashorn is considered. Uh, we are introducing some ECMAScript 6 features, but that's, uh, that, you know, that's ECMAScript 6 features are just a plain matter of programming. I'm not really, don't want to talk about those. Performance is much more interesting because uh, as uh, Slava also says, like, yeah, it's, 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 it's super easy to write a slow language runtime, right? So if it's just an interpreter, then it's usually very simple. Um, as a corollary, it is hard to write a performing language runtime. And what's also nice is that, uh, I mean, it feels uh, that you, ca you can spend a lifetime writing optimizations because there's always, always something that you still didn't explore. And especially with a language such as JavaScript, because the darn thing is so radically dynamic that that there is no single valid optimization strategy. You basically you gotta try them all, and uh, well, there's no such thing as all. It's a, it's 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 a pretty much an open problem. And I, I want to talk about various things related to uh, runtime performance. So uh, in NAS, one the tricks that we do for. Uh, Good runtime performance. The biggest thing that we do is this uh, this thing that we've already talked in various other forums as well, named optimistic typing. But we did actually do a lot of uh, other stuff. Um, there's type specialized compilation in there. We are doing a lot of static code analysis. We are doing uh, classical compiler optimizations. 
we, we, we are also doing this, taking advantage of runtime context. I will expand on that. What does it mean? The biggest thing definitely is the optimistic typing, which if I want to be pedant and precise, I would have to call it gradual deoptimization with on-stack code replacement, because that's really what it is. You can, you can even think about it as, it, it, is, it is sort of the, the opposite of the classical, let's first interpret and then collect types and then, uh, and then optimize the code for that. We rather say, well, let's start from the most optimistic possible representation and then whenever, we, whenever there's a reality check, then we gradually de-optimize. So, so we are trying to find the, the, the optimal executable version starting from the other end, from the most optimal one instead of starting from the from interpreted one. Jury is still out whether, uh, which, which, which advantage is better, but you know, this is how we roll. Uh, the first thing that we do is we, we have parame parameter type specialized compilation, which means that if you, if you have a function declared in JavaScript, then depending on uh, what are the types of parameters that you pass in, you will actually get uh, different variants uh, below the hood. So for every name, so, so well, not name, so for every function, you might actually end up with several different versions of the code and uh, they will be specialized. And they are, uh, all NASON compilation is lazy, so it means that in this particular example, oh, we're not allowed to move, right? Uh, uh, if you invoke the function square with 500, at that first point of invocation is where it will be compiled, and it will be compiled in this uh, first code on the right, where we just load the arguments as, as, as ints, they're declared as ints, and we do an invoke dynamic IML, so you can see that there is a sleight of hand there, uh, and then we return it. On the other hand, if you invoke it with, uh, with a double argument, then we will generate this other version, which is also, which is also fairly trivial. Um, I'm thinking about demoing some of these things, but uh, I think it's a square. Yeah, that's the one put some, some additional markers, but they're not terribly, oh, they're actually nice to leave in. Is it visible or do I need to increase the font? I think this is a fairly small, cool, this is a fairly small uh, room, so I'll probably we'll, we'll see it. So if you search for, oh yeah, it's F, it's square, you will see that uh, indeed we have one version of it that just doing this uh, load, load, multiply, return, and we'll have an another version later on, which after we printed this marker, which will do the do the double. So you can also see that that the version with the double was only compiled after this print marker was emitted. So we we indeed compile everything only only when needed, not earlier. Um, of course, if you do some crazy stuff as in you actually pass a object, then we will happily compile an object version as well, but this one will not be fancy. It will do things by the specification, load the object, invoke the JavaScript compliant, rules compliant uh, conversion to number, do it twice. Of course, it has to do it twice because if you do even crazier thing as in uh, having your object have an internal state and its, uh, it's, it's numeric value being uh, being something that increments over time, the square function will actually return a number that is actually not a square of any of any int. Whereas, if you believe me, you notice how this is a pattern. You were also using square in your yeah. You're using square root, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, one one really neat thing about the parameter type specialized compilation is that. Uh, uh, it does actually sort of incidentally, or I don't know, by design, it works with higher order functions too. So uh, as, as, the, as the function is actually a holder for all of the code versions that it specializes on, even in this case where I, I, I insert a level of indirection, so I have an, an apply function, it doesn't do anything, it just applies its first argument to the second one, and then I, uh, and then I call square, even if I so, so if I pass an int into the apply, it will end up invoking the int version of the uh, of the of the square, and if I uh, pass a double, it will end up even through the apply. It will end up. I it will generate two versions of apply: one that uh, takes a function and an int, another that takes a function and a double, and the one that takes a function and an int will end up actually invoking the 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 uh, the square with an int, and the uh, the other will uh, do the same with a double. 
it's uh, pretty neat because basically these type assumptions propagate. Ultimately, the it means that we we ideally want to be in a state where we never unnecessarily widen a type of an expression uh, in the code. So um, there's another thing that needs to be handled, and this is where the sleight of hand, why are we not just multiplying the numbers? Why are we doing an invoke dynamic to some multiplication operation? Why are we doing this? Well, we're doing it because we are also using, uh, because we need to deal with, uh, with uh, well, arithmetic overflow, among other things. So in this example, uh, the square of uh, 2 to the 17th will uh, overshoot the, the int range. So if we just did, did the classical multiplication, we would get an overflow. And well, we would not be terribly happy about that, right? So uh, we cannot just use imul there. We need to use a, use, a, use a special operator. And this special operator If you, if you look at the bytecode that's generated for this uh, function, then you will notice that we do actually protect the invocation of that uh, multiplication with a, with a try catch. And the catch block is doing, do, is doing something crazy sinister at the, first, uh, at, at the first sight. What it's doing is it is gathering the values of all the local variables. It is doing an invoke dynamic to something that then packs them into an array. And then it actually creates a new a, an, another exception that's called rewrite exception, and then it throws it out. That's basically the the uh, guts of our on stack code replacement, and we'll get into it a bit. I just want to show you what does the invoke dynamic IML link to. It links to this thing. It basically says take two ints, try to do, do, uh, try to multiply them, and math multiply exact actually. Uh, throws an uh, arithmetic exception on an int overflow, at which point we, we resort to doing a long multiplication and throw an exception, which we call unwarranted optimism exception, talking about crazy names in Java libraries. Uh, and there is also a program point, which, uh, which is just an increasing int that, that more or less corresponds to, let's, let's pretend that it corresponds to the offset in the bytecode, so that you know that at which point in your method was this exception thrown, and then you go back, this catch handler uh, packs all your local variables and throws another exception, which will be handled further upstream, and then the code regeneration will happen. We'll get into that uh, as well. So basically what we are doing here is at this point we are capturing a continuation, really. And of course, we did the long multiplication because from the point of view of the operation of the program, all of this has to be transparent. So uh, the, the program does not care that it had to de-optimize. So the de-optimization must be transparent. Otherwise, you, would ha you, you could hardly call it a de-optimization, right? Um, we are doing something uh, similar with, uh, instead of, uh, in addition to arithmetic overflows, uh, property accesses and element array accesses, array element accesses are also, uh, are also, are also performed with uh, this uh, optimism in mind. So when you say, if you have a function and you say uh, function f a return a food times two, then the first time you do this, and I think I do have this here. Yep. So if you if you if you if you run this little program, oh wait, it's called the opt property. So if you look at the first execution of the program, it will load its first argument. And we will try to, th th this, this long descriptor in invoke dynamic basically says, get the property or element or method. I won't explain why. Foo. And let's presume it will be an int. This is the, opti this is the optimistic typing. You cannot, pro uh, I mean, Again, JavaScript, the radically dynamic language. You access a property, you have no idea what the type will be. You try to retrieve an element from an array, you have no idea statically what the type will be. So you say, well, let's assume the best. It should be an int. And then here's the rest of the program with the assumption that actually after this ex uh, instruction executed, we do have an int on the stack, so we put another int on the stack too. We multiply them again with the invoke dynamic stuff because it might overflow, and then I return. Very nice. However, uh, 
this very obviously will fail because the value of foo is 2.1. So, so as, as as this code is compiled, this this property getter cannot return an int, right? Or I mean, it could, but it would be incorrect if it rounded it. So, it is not allowed to do that. So at this point again, an exception will be thrown. We will write the code, and and here is actually the second version of the same code, which is much much simpler. It only does it only loads the argument, does the invoke, but now it actually there's a D at the end. So we regenerated the code with a uh, with a different version. It returns a double, and after that we just you know load a double constant two, do a double multiplication. There is no such thing as a invoke dynamic overflow sensitive double because they don't overflow. Fortunately, at least the JavaScript number semantics happens to be the same as the as the as the Java double semantics. So at least you don't need to have any special handling there. So, and and as you can see, the the type of the function also evolved from uh, returning an int to returning a double. And and now this second version will run, of course. But again, the problem is that by the time the original bytecode here started executing this point. It throws an exception here. After we obtain the double, we need to continue the execution, right? We would need to still load to do the multiplication return, but we can't do it because we jumped out of the function because we had to recompile it. So we actually compile a third version of the same function, which, as you can see, takes this rewrite exception, which encapsulates a continuation as its argument. Uh, at the beginning, it has some NOP8 throws because we, we are just lazy in a code generator. We just do like, we just execute the code generator and then we just jump back to the point where it has to go and ASM realizes that the beginning of the method is uh, inaccessible. So, but this only executes once, so we don't really care. And then, and then it continues, continues the execution, right? And here's why it happens. So as you can see at the beginning, we have a go to L0 and this guy here actually unpacks the local variables from the from the exe ca captured exception restores the stack and then and then jumps back here and so this is the this is the rest of, of the method that executes at this point um, yeah I told you all of this so um, in order to de optimize running code we need two requirements. We need to recompile it on the fly, and we need to be able to replace running code on top of the stack. And the great thing is that we actually achieved this with a pure bytecode solution. This runs on any JVM. We didn't have to resort to any VM-level tricks. So this is not uh, this is not Oracle Nashorn. This is basically Open JDK Nashorn. And if you took the source code of Nashorn and you put it on a on a on a on a non Open JDK VM that nevertheless has full Java 8 specification implemented, this would just work. Um, so, again, what happens? We throw an exception where time assumptions are too narrow. We relink the call site uh, in a caller with the exception handler that derails into the compiler. It recompiles a new version of the code. It recompiles a continuation version of the code, and then it jumps into the continuation. There's a lot of other things that have to also happen. In, in, in extremely simplified terms, at every call site, when we are linking to a call to a function that we know that can the optimize, we actually link a try catch combinator where we do in very simplified terms what we do is try invoking the function and if a rewrite exception bubbles out from the function then you do the thing whereby do the thing I mean what I just said which is recompile the function store the continuation version jump into it also, invalidate all other call sites that might have been linked with the old version. So we actually are using switch points. So if, uh, if you are calling a function from multiple locations, then a deoptimizing recompilation in one will use a switch point, point invalidation to invalidate all the others. So next time they are hit, they will actually relink to the new version of the, uh, of the code, to the partially uh, invalidated one. Of course, there's tricky stuff like deoptimizing recompilation presence of either recursive or mutually recursive functions, it's uh, problematic because now you have the new version of the code executing on your stack top, but you can still have the old version of the code executing somewhere below. 
it is actually not a problem because when the stack unwinds, and we are not unwinding the stack, you know, we just like do one level, one frame continuation. But when your stack gets uh, gets unwound and it hits the old version that's still on the stack, no worries. It will it will either depending on its control flow, it might hit the same the optimizing point or not. At that point, we realize that oh, you know, we actually already the op have a new version that deoptimized that. So we are not compiling a new version at that point. We are just uh, but we need to create a create a new one shot continuation at that point though. And of course, uh, and of course, uh, it's possible to have cascading compiles because if a uh, if there is hundred points in your method that can get invalidated, then you can have the continuation also hit another invalidation, de-optimize de further, de-optimize further, de-optimize further. So you might actually have like the initial execution of your code like power through and, and de-optimize in a, in a basic, in a torrent of recompilations until it gets there. Now this could have the problem of exhausting the stack. So here is this exactly the same thing that Remy said is, uh, is, is, is how do you do a sort of tail call. We also have fold an exact invoker. So instead of do the thing, we have a do the thing and return a method handle the continuation version. And we then uh, fold that into an exact invoker. And these are also the things that uh, uh, the, the, this kind of craziness actually led us to to, to bug the uh, folks doing the Java Lang invoke. So here's Vladimir and we went through and he's like, uh, you know what, uh, we need the catch combinator to be fast in the fast path. I was like, well, it, it is up to eight arguments. <laughs> eight arguments? Come on. We have JavaScript programs that are passing 30 arguments around. <laughs> I mean... How can eight even be a special case? <laughs> yeah, right. For a while, though, we're really lucky. There's a visa barrier between the EU and Russia. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 So... And of course, I mean, getting all piece of this logic, it can mess with your sanity. I sometimes was tweeting things, and I started illustrating my tweets with uh, this card game named Cthulhu Gloom. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, it's a great card game. It's a, you are given a care of a family, and you have to inflict as much terror on them by playing cards on them <laughs> before you kill them off. And the scoring is based on on the on the number of inflicted points before you kill them off, and then. Yeah, a lot of misery, and you can you can also there's also uh, positive cards, but you typically like fortunate events, but you typically play those on your op opponent's family members because you can also do that. It's it's, it's super twisted, but I but I really start as like a, a, a delved too deep. If you gaze into the abyss, uh, card seemed like a like pretty good for illustrating something that I was doing with the Nason parser at the time, and and here we have our esteemed track host. Uh, Reminiscing on the on the cla on the uh, hidden classes problem, so uh, yeah. You came out on the other side, though, and I think yeah. it's just a tiller with no demons attached. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. So anyway, come work for us. <laughs> we have comfortable office carpets. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, for uh, the optimization, we have an extremely simple uh, type hierarchy. We promote from int to long to double to object. And some people actually tell us that we shouldn't really bother with 64-bit longs. Uh, I have a bug file for Nashorn right now, which is called Nashorn is too precise, because if you widen to 64-bit longs, then sometimes you get more precision than you can have in a 64-bit in a, in a, in a double if you are operating with, the, with those. So eh, I don't know. Maybe one day. So. Um, this is one of those, you know, pretending, pretend, pretending to sneak in mathematics into this. Um, if you have your uh, your uh, function and you have all the points in it that can you start out as ints, then the optimization is basically just a stepping in this lattice of type tuples. So you start from, hey, let's let's presume every possible unknown v type will be an int, and on the other hand, you have the sad, lonely. Uh, case of well everything turned out to be objects and uh, you are basically whenever any of these uh, assumptions are invalidated you compile a new version that you you're basically stepping through this lattice trying to find the 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 version of the code that's the narrowest version of the code through which all your data can still flow 
that's pretty much what it d does. So I don't want to be optimistic. Static analysis helps a lot with this. So if we just uh, multiply two numbers, but we know that the, the result will be coerced into an in, then you know why bother? We just uh, take the ints, we just do imal, and then we don't worry about it. I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure that, uh, yeah, so this is this case. If I, if I, if I just have a function and I, and I do this, then uh, then it just ends up being an I load, I load, I mal, I return. It cannot get more. It, it cannot get easier than that. Th this is because it knows that the OR operator courses its result into an int anyway. So you know, it's it. You don't you don't even have to do any uh, guards for the optimizing. We also have this really really great uh, situation where we can uh, uh, where. It's funny when I say like we are writing a JavaScript compiler or a runtime or anything. In in the language specification, you don't have separate compile and and run phases. It just you know meshes together. They they, they blend into each other. So uh, we use it to to optimize stuff. So for instance, in this particular case here, um, you would think that normally. If you invoke this function, you pass x and y to be doubles, then when you hit evaluating o.x, then you will see, oh, damn it, it's not an int, it's a double. You recompile a new version where o.x is a double, uh, but you keep o.y as an int. And then you continue executing that, you hit on it, oh, damn it, o.y, it's also an int, let's recompile it again another version and make it be a double. And then you multiply them and return the result. However, we have our compiler actually peak at the data. So at, at the point where we are evaluating this expression and it optimizes, the compiler can actually look at the value stored in the object. So it's actually when it's recompiling a new version, it will, it, it, it will look at O.Y. It, it tries to safely evaluate those expressions that can be evaluated without side effects. And it will notice that, well, you know, this two is double. So uh, we, we have the compiler use the data visible at the runtime to, to also guide it. So instead of de-optimizing twice, we only de-optimize once. And this is, a, this is a snippet from the Octane box 2 d where they actually do this. So imagine if each one evaluation of these, and these are mostly doubles, triggered the optimization. That would be a lot of, 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 of very wasteful uh, recompilation. Rather, when we hit the first time that this dot m underscore body a turns out to be a double, we will actually, the compiler will actually evaluate all the other expressions. And if it sees that they have to be wider, it will just emit one code version that's already widened. So uh, yeah, and uh, you know, there's a funny observation that, hey, we have a static type inference uh, engine in our dynamic language runtime. This is also new for uh, 8040 something that I spent January to March last year writing. And uh, we, it is super beneficial because we are targeting a statically typed uh, runtime. Bytecode is typed, right? So NASA now calculates types for expressions and local variables. And uh, types are propagated. Uh, it handles all kinds of tricky control f situations, control into catch blocks, breaks from a finally, mm -hmm. whatever. So. There's a lot of things. We also recognize if value of an expression is used as an object. So if uh, if you uh, f evaluate an expression, but later on you will be retrieving property from them, or you call it, so it's a fun so it's a function, then uh, then then we won't presume that it will be returned as an int ever, right? We will immediately go to hey, let's make sure this is an object. We also have this trick where. In try block, we can have uh, variables be live for multiple types at the same time. In this example, uh, at, uh, in this line, uh, A is clearly an int. However, when you enter the try block, we will actually define it in a separate bytecode slot as a double, because, because it can actually become a double here. And we cannot prove that print doesn't throw, right? And when we, when we reach this join point, we must uh, we must know uh, well we have to have a definite static type otherwise the JVM verifier will reject the code and so when it comes out here it must be a double and since we cannot prove that uh, say the print function or whatever function won't throw an exception we must make sure that even if the execution reaches here 
it, it exists as a defined double value. So here it will be used as an int. Since it's redefined to an int here, but it will actually be at the same time promoted. It's always every assignment is updating into a double slot as well. Um, if I compile this, I have this very same code is here. Oh, it's not called try, it's called catch. So if uh, we compile catch.js, you can see how, how um, here at line 3, we only have a try block. So line 2 is pretty simple, say equal a equals 1. So you load 1, you store it in slot 3, which is a. But then line 3 is just a try block. But what we do here is that we load that slot, convert it to double, and we store it into a different slot. If you look at the local variable table here at the bottom, we have a as an int in slot 3, and we have a as a double in slot 4. And later on, even though we define it as a double here, this print a in line uh, 4 will, will actually still be using the int. So in the try block, we are always using the narrowest type available. But when we are assigning it here, we will assign number uh, the value 3, but we will also promote it to int, store it in 4. So we are always making sure that slot 3 will have the value 3, it's unfortunately as int, but slot 4 will have the value 3.0. And then when we leave, when we leave the block, then here when we are printing it, we'll always load the double. So at this point, it is, it, 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 it is always a double. So that's one of the tricky things that you need to do, uh, have multiple type liveness. Uh, same thing happens here. This is less obvious. Uh, here, we need to have a synthetic else branch that basically initializes i to the special value of undefined. Ain't JavaScript great, right? So variables that are not defined can still be read. And for that, it maintains a special type called un undefined. So Cool. <laughs> cool story. And uh, so actually here at this point, we need to introduce, uh, so we actually do, here we use it as an int, but uh, here it has to be an, an object because if x was evaluated to false, actually we need to create an, un uh, create an undefined value. So uh, we do a lot of dead code elimination, which is uh, normal stuff. Uh, dead code elimination is actually needed also because uh, we, it, it becomes as a side effect of, uh, of, uh, of uh, something that we call type liveness. Uh, in an ideal world, we would have full static uh, liveness analysis on values. We don't because we only have an AST right now, and it's hard to do uh, liveness analysis on an AST. Actually, probably impossible. But and uh, and uh, as a side effect, we got a lot of dead store elimination, but. If we don't have any liveness analysis, then we are in a big trouble because uh, uh, because sometimes you end up having to propagate types, uh, propagate types even though so, sorry promote types to object even though you wouldn't have to. So the difference between these two slides is just this blinking, blinking because I'm switching between the slides. Print x, but uh, it is it actually creates radically different code. Because in this case, we can actually prove that x is only ever read as an int. So this is the only time it's used. However, here, it is actually read. It might be read as, a, might be read as undefined. It cannot really, because you could prove that this is always entered. But let's imagine a for loop that might not, that might not be entered. We are not so good to, to, to prove Should that it's always. I don't know. Uh, so in this case, we actually emit reasonable code, you know, it's, uh, oh, I apply this, excellent. So this is this code. So if you look at, at it, x is always defined as int, and line number, yeah, four and five, actually here, see it's, uh, actually used as an int throughout and it's fine now if I also add a print X here 
then something frankly horrible happens, which is, which is x suddenly has to have an object slot. And I'll do it again. Um, line 3, I guess. I actually need to, when I, before I enter the loop, I need to store undefined into it, because what if I don't enter the loop? And what's even worse is that on every back edge, I will, ev even though I'm using it as an int in the loop, I still have this dual representation. And on every back edge of the loop, I will create an integer value of for it, its boxed version. And this is all because it is also used here. Now, I would like to think that like 30% of this problem is inherent in a dynamic language. Or, like 70% is actually JavaScript's brain dead local variable scoping rules, because if I declare a var inside of a loop body, then why the hell is it still available and defined outside of the loop body? But that's how JavaScript rolls. JavaScript 6 has a let, which actually has actual block scoping. But in JavaScript, a var is always, a var declaration is, is, uh, is live for the full duration of the function. So, OK, well, so not, o not only JavaScript. Excellent. <laughs> You're doing something right. So I well, we don't. Do uh, uh, in JRuby 9000? Yeah, but in the uh, previous one, you. No, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, well, y you, need, you need an I representation for that. So I, I will not tell you about other stuff. We have a lot of everything that works there. Array representation is similar to what uh, Slava was telling about V8. Um, we have efficient like linking of built-ins like array push pop and uh, etc. Uh, we recognize some of the patterns like typically in constructors we have this uh, function applied this arguments that uh, we can optimize and so on. So what we would like to get uh, to in the uh, near future is uh, getting a much nicer compiler pipeline for Nashorn because uh, we after we parse we. We parse the source code into an AST, and we have a lot of transformation steps. Uh, we fold the constants, uh, split the functions, uh, static type calculation. Uh, I don't need you now. Um, and in the end, we have the code gen, which is, as you can see, it's a bolder arrow, which translates all of that to JVM bytecode. And it's heavy machinery, because all the logic for optimistic operations, continuation, uh, emitting code for continuation handling, uh, self-assignment stores, uh, control flow handover for split functions. Actually, that's th that, that no longer lives there. Uh, it's it's all in that one class. It's a, it's a, it's a big class, and I'm not happy about that. However, in order to do something about it, we have this idea to produce this dynamically typed bytecode, which is uh, which is also an uh, another intermediate representation, and basically move most of what CodeGen does today into this dynamic code gen, which at the very least would, uh, would look like much like bytecode does, except it doesn't really have explicit types when it starts out. And we could have a bunch of uh, optimization steps on this bytecode, like honest to goodness liveness analysis, anything that you need a uh, uh, backwards control flow uh, for, for, for performing, you could ha have on it. And then CodeGen would just become a very straightforward dynamic bytecode to, to ordinary Java bytecode translator. However, uh, for that, we would actually need this new intermediate representation. And as I said, there is a bunch of uh, benefits to it. Um, JRuby 9000 obviously already beat, beat us to proving the point, because JRuby 9000 does have uh, an uh, IR representation now, and you know they're pretty happy with it. They can do. Uh, their liveness analysis and everything else. Uh, ASTs are language independent. Bytecodes aren't, or at least they are less so, which actually would allow us, if we go back here, to all of the, the DTFN part, all the optimizations that happen on this dynamic bytecode level, which includes static type calculation and so on, this could be fed in by, different, by languages other than, uh, language runtimes other than Nashorn. Right, and uh, this is basically our reusability slash toolchain idea for dynamic languages on the JVM. It is, uh, it is a little bit. I mean, our typical elevator pitch for this is like LLVM just for JVM bytecode. And 
of course, the question is also why, right? So the language runtimes are these black boxes or yellow circles, as chance has it, that you feed a source code into it and it runs. And in our case, um, language runtime on the JVM is actually either an interpreter and or a compiler plus assorted runtime libraries that stand between source code and uh, source code of your dynamic language program and execution on the JVM. So reuse is also a big driver. So V8, last time I checked, and this was last year, so you probably have more lines r right now. It's probably a million-ish lines of code. NAS one has 200,000-ish. Because, of course, we can cheat. We have the underlying Java platform provides us with garbage collection and, uh, and, uh, and uh, various object management and other things, um, code loading, uh, JIT compiling, etc., etc. right? Now imagine that uh, your language runtime could also tap into some of those uh, 200 uh, kilo lines of code to, uh, for implementation of your language runtime. So you would need even less than NASHorn if you could reuse part of the NASHorn and the JVM. So how would this, uh, this work? Uh, the idea is that if you have a very simple program that just multiplies two numbers, then what you have here with this, this hypothetical uh, format where you just load the arguments, multiply, return, and you uh, suspiciously there's no I in front of any of those, right? You just leave the, the current static type inferencing machinery that I have for NASHorn and that works on an ASD. An equivalent of that running on this format could just uh, run through the code and just pencil in the types in front of the bytecodes where it needs to. And for those cases where it cannot prove the types, it would still default to optimistic typing. So optimistic typing and the static typing are pretty much going, pretty much go hand in hand because we want to prove as many types as we can and for everything we cannot prove, there's, there's optimistic typing. Yeah, these are less interesting. Uh, property getters would work the same way. This would, uh, uh, as you, just as you have uh, get field instruction in bytecode, you could have a get prop instruction where you load an object, say get prop foo. That, that that that's what you would emit here, and actually, actually the runtime would make sure that the uh, appropriate invoke dynamic is emitted in its place, that the multiplication ends up being an overflow sensitive, the optimizing multiplication if it needs be. So, so you as a language designer, language runtime designer, would have to emit this, and we would, we would figure out this rest for you. And also emit the unwarranted optimism exception, the write exception, the, the, the whole shebang with the, with the generating the one-time continuation, jumping into it. It's all a service that, that, that our stuff can provide. Hypothetically, we could also do lexical scope getters as well, but uh, I believe we won't. Uh, I was actually presenting the slide in a previous, uh, previously, and uh, I, was, I was quite enthusiastic about uh, being able to, to, uh, to uh, load information from uh, lexical scope. Actually, that Y should be a, a Z. Sorry, that's a, that's a, that's a slide bug. So, so just imagine Z in place of this Y. Uh, so theoretically, uh, we would be able if you pass in a uh, if if you pass in a function which is in JavaScript really just a tuple of uh, of, a, of a code and a scope. You can extract the scope from it, and then you can use it as a as an object, and you can query it for properties. So uh, so uh, it would uh, it would be possible to to do this, but uh, I'm I'm. Now, right now, we have an excellent thesis student, guy, uh, Andreas, and uh, we we had a discussions about this, and it looks like it's not ne actually doing lexical scopes is not such a good idea because uh, uh, the JVM bytecode is not hierarchical. Uh, bytecode uh, methods are flat, right? So in a class, you have methods. There's no notion of functions being nested into one another. So it's hard to represent. I mean, you can with the naming. And maybe we could solve it saying that the G is nested in F. So whatever is the scope of uh, F 
should be consulted when you are trying to, to find the value of uh, s s some, va some values in G. Um, it's not, not trivial. I'm not sure that we want to go there. So um, we can do another things automatically. One of the nuisances that you have to deal with dynamic languages on the JVM is that you need to split large methods into chunks that are less than 64K. Having had to write that, I'm, uh, I don't want to write it again. It was not fun. So uh, um, again, uh, writing a splitter on top of an intermediate representation works much better because you have much better ideas of the actual sizes there. Um, yeah, I am wrapping up, actually. Um, so in a summary, uh, some things are really uh, so some some things are hard, and they come up in every dynamic language that you would want to implement on a JVM. Static type analysis is such; it's a nice to have type specialized on-demand compilation. The the whole framework around the optimistic types is uh, pretty non-trivial to uh, to to create, and we solve these with Nashorn. And it would be great if we could offer them as a reusable library to the community, to the to the Java platform users. But we need a suitable code representation as it's input and AST is just too high level and JVM bytecode is too statically typed. So that this is why we are thinking in something that's almost bytecode, but uh, starting out untyped, having a local type inference engine that solidifies types and leaves the rest for the, uh, for the optimistic uh, uh, typing framework. So yeah, that's pretty much it. One experiment that we did to see how pluggable Nasrin is right now is to have our thesis student, Andreas Gabrielson, stand up, Andreas. There he is. We're trying to uh, make him an offer right now. Um, <laughs> is, is no one else gets him. This is uh, the glamorous life you get if you yes, come to work uh, Yes, he's actually implemented a, a, a functionally uh, almost complete TypeScript on top of Nasrin already. So we hope we can open source that if no one puts any commercial claim on it and it doesn't look like anyone will. So. Questions? Right. Uh, I have one question, one remark. Kay. So the x multiplied by x five zero, you can compile that to integer multiplication because the overflow of the precision for the large integers will cause you to produce incorrect results. That's one thing. No. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can show you counter example. Uh, yeah, show me, show me values. <laughs> yeah, I will show you the values. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and the question is, can you compile, like, the? It can be that the function is uh, only kind of bad in the beginning, but after some prefix which does something with arguments, like for example, there can be optional argument which can be null or a number. Mm -hmm. So, can you compile like the tail of the function? Right. No, we cannot. It would be nice. It's uh, it's one it's one of those things. Uh, yeah, we are aware of uh, this possibility for for intra intra function specialization. It's and uh, and of course it's heuristical. It's, uh, it's it's because obviously if you are doing it all the time, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's an. Uh, it's an anal analogous problem to 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 being on an inlining budget, really. So because you are exploding your code. You can also use but call sites, right? Because if you have call sites that call a integer, a lot of those call sites, mm -hmm. you don't want to call the version which also sends objects because you're boxing. Yes. So to link directly to the same, right? Yeah, that would be. The, yeah, that, yeah, that's true. But uh, no, we don't have anything like that right now. I don't have any questions specifically, but some of the pain points that you mentioned, uh, yeah. the way that we're hoping to solve them or are solving them in 9000, uh, the new IR, we do have a prototype inlining pass mm -hmm. that can inline through uh, a closure receiving method and route it back to where the closure came from, things along those lines. Uh -huh. And we've, we have have run code and, and made it actually function that it will inline through an each or something mm -hmm. all the way back and then we run the additional optimization passes and stuff starts to fold away in the lexical scope. Mm -hmm. um, the That's other part is that we also have uh, our basic blocks and the control flow graph and so we can start looking at just emitting part of those as 
uh, one specialization and part of those is another specialization oh, yeah. or part of them in one body of JVM code and part of them in another. Uh, and in our case, in order to generate the backtrace that Rubyists expect, we already do post-process of the stack trace. So mm -hmm. as long as we can encode enough information into our synthetic busted up methods, we should be able to reconstitute it and throw out all the synthetic pieces and produce the right backtrace for them too. So mm -hmm. it, it looks like we should be able to address both of those with just the, the fairly simple IR we have now. Right. And uh, you are also, um, this means that you can also uh, do pretty much what uh, Slava is, uh, is proposing, that you can have a, uh, parts of the functions uh, specialized for different types because, well, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, at the end of the day, I mean, every basic block is just a function. You, you do, uh, if, you, if you have data dependencies between them, then you, you, you sacrifice being able to keep them in the same local variable scope, though, but so, so that's why I'm saying this is, is, is all heuristics. Okay. Um, well, I have, I have one question and one remark. So, in one, it would be interesting to to know how some of the reusable pieces that you're working on compare to Truffle, mm -hmm. um, and uh, which is kind of the sec the second thing is a bit of a remark. As somebody who I would love to have more reusable pieces that <coughs> plug into like our project, um, I wonder really what how much is really possible to share between um, different languages, mm -hmm. um, because things like the dynamic type bytecode, um, I, I think the language that I work on looks at very, very differently in, in terms of its scoping, in terms of its semantics. Um, maybe are there some other lower level pieces like the method splitting or um, maybe the, the rewriting part? I mean, I, I'm just saying as a consumer. Yeah. For example, yeah, I, I think as a consumer, I would love to see more smaller pieces than mm -hmm. one rule, one VM to rule yeah. them all. Yes. We're actually aiming to uh, to get these smaller pieces out in an API as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that Andreas did for his thesis. He didn't just implement TypeScript. He did it as part of finding out how uh, pluggable Nazorn is as a uh, multi-language architecture for the named languages on the JVM. Yeah. So, yeah, so, yes. that's the, yeah, so, th so that's the idea, really, that, um, yeah, I can imagine that uh, the, the, these, the, these old things, so the the type inference engine is one thing. The the optimistic typing thing is uh, a little bit of another thing. Uh, code splitting. Well, if you if you're talking about the context of say Truffle, uh, Truffle really, uh, as far as I understand it, uh, really shines when it uh, when it uh, cooperates with Graal, right? And I'm pretty sure that Graal is a low-level compiler. I would imagine that it doesn't have a 64k anything limit. Because that's that I, I mean the 64k limit on a bytecode. This is really just a class file format. Uh, limitation really. If we had a new mm, class file version that that raises those limits uh, for uh, to 32 bits. Yeah. All right. Anyway, classic case of not my problem, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Life is full of. Yeah. Life is full of inlining budgets, no matter how good your yes. is. So I, I have a comment, and that is um, uh, your uh, untyped IR is interesting from also from the point of view if you uh, take the method header, which says um, specific types for the parameters, mm -hmm. and then you um, replace those types with type variables, then you get type you get untyped all the way through from the top, and at that yes. point you have a common representation for the optimistic and the less optimistic versions of your method. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm saying this oh is yeah. because that um, that is also how we would like to think of um, uh, parametric polymorphism in Java, right? Because uh -huh. we want to do list of int. That's, that's polymorphism which somehow erases the distinction between the i's and the a's and the d's and so forth. Yes. So uh, in, um, for similar reasons to yours, the, the discussions that we're having about parametric polymorphism on Project Valhalla and eventually value types, mm -hmm. they double down on this problem. We would kind of like to get rid of the uh, the type, the, the weak typing in the bytecodes and mm -hmm. just have a common bytecode uh, for all types of, for all bindings of a type parameter. Right. So I, I guess what I'm saying is it's not un 
foreseeable, it's possible that we might actually want something closer to the VM that is fairly typeless mm -hmm. and that can be repurposed for ints right now and strings later on and so forth. Um, and if, if, that's a, if, that, if that sounds useful, um, I realized also looking at your, um, your use of IR, maybe another interesting operation on, on this uh, new bytecode, this IR, would be to um, do continuation shredding and to have, um, as a first class operation supplied by the VM, re-entry with partial state at an mm -hmm. arbitrary location. Yeah, because yeah. I yeah. see you're faking that with those knobs. It's, yeah, it would it, it would be great. I have, I have a, uh, I admittedly, quite often think about the about the technology I'm working on from a slightly myopic version of, uh, I I have the, my current VM specification. And I need to I need to have everything run on the VM specification. You you are thinking more in terms of how can we further the VM specification. I'm, I'm, I'm typically targeting whatever is in production right now. So, uh, but, 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 but the VM support for, uh, for jumping into a middle of a method with a partial state. Yeah, a man can dream. So yeah. I yeah, I mean, we are the product org, so we have to have these boring, yes. uh, greasy fingers. No, uh, when I say a man can dream, I'm not being skeptical about no, this no, no, no. being created. I say I would, like, I would like this. I would genuinely like this. Yeah. <laughs> OK, excellent. Are we done, uh, Duncan? Final question, Duncan. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned um, um, that, that's about the uh, specialization, John, because I've been having some, some evil ideas of using it for just this sort of purpose. So, um, <laughs> um, what I was going to ask is, um, you've got your optimistic, um, well, uh, um, uh, optimistic typing. Um, but this being JavaScript, you have to have closures over mutable variables. How are you? How are closures you marrying over? Oh, mutable variables. Yeah. Yeah. How are you um, marrying those two together? Right? Do you have a oh a, a storage cell that can sell so, store multiple types and you, you optimize? No, no, no. Well, uh, well, what we do is that uh, okay. So uh, the question is, we need to have closures over mutable variables, and how does the optimism play into this? Well. It's actually pretty simple because uh, what it does is uh, a read of a read of a scoped variable. If if you have a variable used in a nested context, context, so you have a local variable in a function and you have another function nested in it, and that function is reading it, then uh, what we, uh, then uh, the compiler will emit code where that local variable now lives in a scope object, and we are doing an optimistic getter really on the scope object. So uh, that's... Uh, and what was, what was the oh, yeah. yes, uh, the scope object, we right now do something that's called dual fields, which uh, unfortunately for, I mean, most values will be represented by both, a, uh, have both a long field and an object slot allocated to them. So uh, we will store... Lo lo yeah, the long field has either an encoded 32-bit, 64-bit, or a double in it, encoded by bits, and the object is for the object because Java, uh, the JVM doesn't let you store a reference in a primitive in the same field for obvious reasons. We, we have a specialized array uh, type that does that. That's submitted as a patch like two years ago by Rickard and uh, John and some other people to the MLVM list, but uh, we haven't had time to do anything in JVM land on the site. So I think that's all. Uh, the guys of you here who are speaking